Now, John, we, we spent this entire interview talking about you so far as a singer, oh. and, <laughs> which, which I would love to go on all afternoon, but actually, yeah. we, 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 I, I've obviously completely got this wrong, and we haven't employed you here at the Grange to sing, sadly. We don't know yet. But we don't know yet. <laughs> It may yet happen. I can see it happening. Um, we've employed you to, to, to direct, and, and, and would you like to tell us a little bit? First of all, one of the things you are absolutely a stickler for, and I support you 100% in that, is that you want to hear every word of the singers yes, I sing. Do. I do. And John is incredibly good at getting that out of singers. Would you like to say a little bit about that, how you do it? And well, it's a question of understanding what we do. I mean, I was talking to a couple of the kids this morning when we were rehearsing, and I was listening to their rehearsal. Sometimes in, a, in a, a, an opera, particularly in, in Handel, when we're singing Handel, you have an enormous number of repeats. I mean, in Semele, she sings, Myself I shall adore, if I persist in gazing. She's got a mirror, if I persist in gazing. She sings it 34 times. <laughs> no, in, in the aria with the, the middle section and the, the, the carpo, you've got to find a way of it being different every time. So it's never exactly the same. There's, fortunately, she has Juno on stage listening. To it. So when you sort of run out of ideas, Juno can go, <laughs> <laughs> That covers a few of myself, I shall agree. But um, the words to me are, t are terribly important. And I did a huge amount of uh, productions at English National Opera, which I enjoyed enormously doing them in English, because I'd grown up at Covent Garden in my eight years at Covent Garden, everything in English. And I, they're part of my psyche. I just know those operas in English. And Traviata is very beautiful in English if people are doing it delicately. Wonderful people like Josephine Barstow, and you know they were great actress, sing great actress singers like Janet Baker, fantastic singing actress. I mean, what more could you want? And I, I really do care enormously. But to the Albert Herring, where, where, are you allowed to give us any little hints about what we might expect? Well, I'm, I will tell you that it will be as close as Benjamin Britten wanted. I grew up with uh, Britten and Joan Cross, I told you about earlier, and I've got a very good idea of what Ben wrote um, and what he actually wanted to see on stage. I mean, including A Midsummer Night's Dream, where he described actually the colour of the forest. I mean, all of that I wrote down, and I've always done it, because I've directed Midsummer Night's Dream a lot. But um, this will be about the Suffolk village, it will be about the villagers, they will be a policeman, they will be the vicar, they will be the schoolmistress, there will be Sid, the butcher's boy, on a bike. Um, Nancy will be a lovely girl, Lady Billows will be autocratic and horrible, and uh, Florence will be Florence. <laughs> and it's what he wrote, and um, it will look like a village in Suffolk, and um, I hope it will be all right. I mean, is there so much going on at the moment where they decide to do operas in a completely different way, they completely rewrite the story, I mean, some like it and some don't. Uh, there's a lot of that going on, and it's just, I'm too old, I'm a dinosaur, I like opera to be what they wrote, it's what they wrote, you know, and remember that, remember that the composer has written the opera around the words, this is something else that is so important, the words don't suddenly appear, and the music doesn't suddenly appear. The composer writes around the words that he's got. Now, he may do a lot of work on the text with the librettist. Of course, we know that's a collaboration, but it comes out of the text and the music. And something that Maria Callas taught me, um, I was so thrilled, 1964. I had done a lot of directing by then, and I thought I knew, sort of, because I knew a lot of operas very, very well by then. Um, but I'd never examined the music on the page. And we were talking about Trovatore one day, and I said, the cadenza. And she said, John, there isn't a cadenza there. I said, well, there is, at the end of the aria. Um, no, John, it's, uh, it's a part of the aria. It's a continuation in the words. A lot of people just sing, ah, and make it a vocalese. But that's actually not what's not written. 
the next the next day she came in with a score of trovatore for me and she showed me exactly and she pointed out where the text continued on the page and it goes all the same thought goes on it's not just broken it's, and she said it's all there it's not just there but the whole and we started looking at music while she was here for that period and she opened the windows that I had never thought of opening and I've been doing that ever since. When you actually look, Massonet particularly gives you very specific instructions. He was a director. He was a very well-known director of theatre, not just opera. And what he writes in his scores and, and um, notes what to do is there. And if you do what he's written, you've got, you've got all those um, Massonet operas sorted. You don't have to worry about them. But when they start, doing something quite different. Well, people are paying £180 or £230 a ticket and they're not getting what was written. And if they want to ask for their money back, they should. <laughs> <laughs> but I think when they write, I'm told by my few friends that do write, they always get the letter back saying, things must move on. <laughs> we're not all dinosaurs and, um, you know, so that's where we're at at the moment. We'll see. It's wonderful that we can have John here uh, working in this industry still to hold up standards of storytelling and of faithfulness to the intentions of both the composer and those who wrote the text that actually we can adhere to. If people want to divert from there, they can divert consciously and knowingly. That's fine to a certain extent, but we have to have those the certainties of, of the truthfulness, I think, at all times. And John Copley here is somebody who we can all hold up, all of us in this industry around the world, as somebody who uh, uh, typifies and, and uh, exemplifies those standards which we can all hold. John, we're going to have to stop now because we have a little bit, but thank you very, very much. Thank you.